made more Busted hard as iron Water like a storm Hello, welcome to City on a Hill. My name is Mariah and this is Ella Ho. Yes. Today we have a very, today's a very special day because we're going to be having our online Christmas carols. How exciting is that? And we had our um, in-person Christmas carols last, last Sunday. Mm -hmm. So you're in for a treat. So please don't go anywhere. Yes, you don't want to miss today's uh, online carol service. We want to be able to sing with you and enjoy a hope-filled message from Pastor Pitt. Um, one of the things that struck us while we were preparing for the carol service was the whole idea of being together for Christmas mm -hmm. with the pandemic, doing everything, you know, to just pull us apart. We don't want to feel, uh, we don't want anyone to feel isolated yeah. this season. So um, do join us on our platform. There are other people on there who you can interact with, yeah. you can speak to, talk about what you're doing for Christmas. You can also request for prayers. And the link is on the screen. Mariah, 86 days to Christmas. How excited are I you? Am so excited i love christmas and you know what i'm looking forward to i'm looking forward to my mom's christmas dinner oh my goodness it's always amazing yeah. and also one of the biggest things i love about christmas is celebrating the birth of jesus mm -hmm. it's so significant mm -hmm. do you know what i mean yeah. so i'm looking forward to that as well i'm excited as well i've got what you call ocd obsessive christmas disorder i love everything that comes with christmas the birth of jesus yes but i love the feeling, you know, everything around that season. So we want to welcome you and invite you to join us now as we sing our first carol. Yay! <laughs> Good to see everyone. Are you ready to join us? Come on. Why this jubilee 
Wow, that was amazing worship team. Thank you so much. We know that a lot of hard work goes into preparing yep. for any service at all. Uh, talk about Christmas. Yep. So we want to say a massive thank you and well done. So Mariah, yes. Christmas time is all about Jesus, mm -hmm. his birth, how he came. Uh, and you know, one of the most important thing is having that relationship with Jesus. Um, you recently just became a follower of Jesus, right? Yeah, so actually I gave, um, I started following Jesus in 2017. Wow, so. 2017. So um, would you love to share your journey, your story with us this morning? I'm sure someone will be encouraged and inspired. Yeah, sure, yes. sure. Uh, I love sharing this story um, because it also reminds me of how far God's brought me as well. Yeah. Um, so I grew up uh, in a Catholic home. Oh, wow. So mm -hmm. I knew about God. I... I prayed, mm -hmm. um, I went to Mass on Sundays, mm -hmm. but beyond that, there was nothing there. I felt like it was just one-sided, there was no wow. relationship, I yeah, think, it was just yeah, one-sided yeah. thing. And at um, university, um, I had a very, very difficult time. I was in a very toxic relationship, a relationship I was um, very lost as well, mm -hmm. and one of my friends invited me to their church. Um, at first I was like, oh, is she trying to convert me or something like that? I so I didn't, I didn't go the first time she asked me. The second time she asked me, I did go. Okay. And honestly, it's like the best, best decision I've ever, ever made in my life, even to this date. Mm. And I went and I remember going in, everybody was so welcoming. Yeah. Um, I've never experienced that before. Like the preaching was so practical. I was like, wow, I this know. is something I could apply to my life. Yeah. I've never had that before. And I also felt God's presence. Like I was very like joyful, very peaceful. I felt like I belonged. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to explain. And, um, and then that's when I started learning that following Jesus is not a one side thing. It's mm. a relationship with Jesus. It is a it's relationship. a relationship. Yeah. And to know that it's a relationship changes everything. He's my he's my father, he's my mother, he's my best friend, he's everything. He's everything. And it transforms your life completely. And um, my life, like it being this faith journey is not easy, it's difficult. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> but it's just um, being incredible and I would not change anything. Oh, wow. um, and I love, <laughs> I love I love Jesus so much. That's so um, beautiful. It's just been amazing. Wow. Yeah, so that's Thank my testimony. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony no and your story. Uh, we have something similar because I was also a Catholic. Okay. Yeah, so I understand when you're talking about you know, <clears throat> the relationship, mm -hmm. but really, really grateful to for you to share your uh, story with our viewers uh, this morning if you are in a position like mariah was back in the day we would love to just invite you to come know jesus even as we celebrate him yeah. so right about now we're going to invite pastor pitt but before that here's a video enjoy it <laughs> folks welcome to carols uh, would you show your appreciation to the team who made all this happen and the worship bands thank you guys and girls really really appreciate all that's gone in to make this a success and uh, welcome to also to the folks joining us online uh, there's a, a church online are joining us today so would you show your appreciations for the online folks welcome great to have you connecting uh, and for those who don't know me, I'm, my name is Pete, pastor here at City on a Hill, and it's a joy to, in these moments, take time to unpack something of the meaning and significance of Christmas. Um, do you know, every year we, we remember this moment. It's a once-a-year moment where we remember and recall <coughs> how Joseph and Mary 
arrived in Bethlehem and Jesus Christ was born. Uh, it reminds me of the story of a guy who uh, his wife was heavily pregnant. She started going into labor, so he rushed her to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, they had a car crash and they were both knocked into a coma. But in the coma, she gave birth to twins, but they were still sub uh, not conscious. Anyway, a few days later, um, they regained consciousness and uh, the brother was sitting beside the man in the hospital and he said, uh, I'm glad you're okay, she, your wife's okay, and you've had twins, everything's okay. And the brother was so relieved to hear that, the, the, the father was. And, uh, and he said, now listen, because you guys were in a coma, the, the doctors needed to write a na names on the birth certificate, so I had to name your kids for you. And the father's saying, oh no, my brother's an absolute joker. So this is going to be the worst possible outcome. So he said, so what, what did you call him? And he said, well, for the daughter, because he had a son and a daughter, for the daughter, she was called Denise. And I said, he thought, okay, that's okay. That's okay. And what about the son? Oh, the nephew. <laughs> Denise and the nephew. But joking aside, here are some things that parents have called their kids this last year. True, okay. Burger. Who would do that? I mean, unless your second name's McDonald, that really is an inappropriate name. Apple. Nutella. Now, I get that one. I can understand why people call Fish and chips. This is twins born in New Zealand. Fish and chips. Ringo. <laughs> Godly. The parents are in for a shock, okay? <laughs> the parents are... Santa. At least when he grows old, he won't need to lie, right? Okay, Santa. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is honest, right? For real. Number four, real. For real. Who would do that? Jigsaw. It's puzzling, isn't it? <clears throat> now, in the Bible, names had important significance. People didn't just call their kids names because they happened to like chocolate spread, so we'll call you Nutella. They had depth to one. When they called a kid a name, it typically had significance, often prophetic significance in the ancient world, and especially in the Jewish culture into which Jesus Christ was born. So with that in mind, I'm going to take you to one of the accounts of the birth of Jesus, and it describes the importance of names. Now, the bit before we're about to read was a genealogy, a family tree. It kind of unpacks how Jesus was born in a family line, several, 14, uh, several series of 14 generations, and then Jesus Christ was born. And this is the tail end of the family tree, and it reads like this. Matthew 1, verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husbands of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David's, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You know, I love... I love the Bible. And one of the things I love about the Bible is on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. I've been reading the Bible since I was 15 years old uh, every day. And I would say it's not uncommon. It would be either daily or at least weekly when I'll be reading the Bible, a book that I'm so familiar with now, and I'll read something. I thought, I have never seen that before. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Right? I mean, it's just, it's that, there's no book like it. It's like you've, you've read it before, and yet you hadn't read that before. It like jumps off the page. And I was, as I was, you know, a few weeks ago, as I was praying about this service, I would just start reading through the account of Jesus' birth, and I read something in these verses that I'd never, ever seen before. And it's in the first little bit, the first sentence I read. It's the end of that family line of Jesus. It says, and I'll repeat it for you, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And I saw something. I'd, I'd never seen it before. Jacob, the father of Joseph. So where else in the Bible 
was there a Jacob who was the father of a Joseph? Well, you go back about 16, 1700 years before Jesus, and there was a famous Jacob, also known as Israel, who had a son, his favorite son, called Joseph. So his Jacob, Jesus' grandfather, having a son called Joseph, Jesus' father, and there is no accident that Jacob, in a Jewish culture, there would be no accident, zero accident, that Jacob would have called his son Joseph. It was totally deliberate. In that Jewish culture where names had so much significance, he would have remembered the ancient patriarch Jacob, who had a son called Joseph, who brought blessing to huge numbers of people. So let me take you back to the original Jacob who had a son called Joseph. This is 1,600 years, 1,700 years before Jesus. Jacob, who's also called Israel, had a son called Joseph. And when Joseph was 17 years of age, Joseph had dreams. And you know the dreams. And, it, and they riled his brother. He's one of them. Genesis 37. He said to them, listen, I had a dream. And we were binding sheaves of grain out in the fields. Then suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to them. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? You, will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream that he had and what he said. So this J Joseph had dreams and whether it was prudent or not, he shared them with his brothers and his brothers were riled. So much so that one day Jacob sent Joseph to his brothers. And when the brothers saw him coming out in the fields, they plotted, we will do away with this dreamer and let's see what becomes of his dreams. And so they beat, set upon him, they beat him, they threw him in a pit, left him for dead, deciding how they were going to do away with him eventually. But Midianite traders happened to be passing fortuitously by at that point. So they sold Joseph instead of killing him. They sold him for pieces of silver to the Midianite traders. And then Joseph went from being this son in a prestigious home to all of a sudden being sold as a slave and taken down to Egypt to be sold in the slave market, where a man by the name of Potiphar purchased him, an official in Egypt's Pharaoh's court. He purchased him, and Joseph was now a slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife took a fancy to Joseph. He was a handsome guy, and so she tried to seduce Joseph. Time after time, she tried to seduce him, and Joseph resisted in his integrity. Eventually, she turned on Joseph and said, though, he tried to rape me. So she had him arrested and thrown in prison. So here's Joseph. He's gone from being this privileged young man in a, in a, in a special family to all of a sudden becoming a slave. Now, he's a prisoner in Egypt. As a prisoner, two fellow prisoners were put alongside him. They were also officials from Pharaoh's court. One was the cupbearer, the other was Pharaoh's baker. And they also had dreams. And Joseph interpreted their dreams, and one was that one of them would be condemned, and one of them would be restored. And as exactly those dreams were stated by Joseph, so God fulfilled it. The cupbearer was restored, but the baker was killed. And years later, when the cupbearer was standing before Pharaoh, Pharaoh declared that he also had dreams. And the cupbearer said, there is a man in prison, a Hebrew, who can interpret dreams. So they brought Joseph from the prison. They shaved him. He looked like a hipster. They shaved him. They dressed him in all fancy stuff. He stood before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh declared to Joseph his dreams. And Joseph interpreted the dreams, and the interpretation was very simple, that there, were, there will be seven years of abundance in the land of Israel, sorry, in the land of Egypt, and that they will be followed by seven years of famine and depravity. And, jo and Joseph said to the Pharaoh, God is warning you about what's going to come so you can prepare. So, so Pharaoh decided that, Joseph, there's no, none wiser than you. I will make you prime minister of Egypt, and you will prepare the land for the famine and uh, in the time of abundance. So Joseph was elevated. So in the seven years of abundance, he managed to store up the grain. So in the seven years of famine, literally multitudes upon multitudes of people were saved from certain death 
because of the preparation that God had done through Joseph. Not only Egyptians were saved, but surrounding nations, people, multitudes were saved from starvation. Now, in case you think that's just a fable, it's just a a story in the Bible, a moral story. This is an interesting BBC article, and BBC is the source of all accurate truth. BBC article in 2009, new scientific evidence helps us to support the case of the historical Joseph. Studies in ice cores found in Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, the mountain which supplies the Nile River with its water, have revealed that a drought did take place 3,600 years ago. That's around about the time that the Bible sets Joseph's story. We also know another event around the same time. One of the most fertile areas in Egypt was the land around Lake Quarren. This lake is fed from water from one of the branches of the Nile. Droughts in Egypt used to cause the branch to dry up, leaving it dr- the land around the lake desolate. But we do know that between 1850 and 1650 BC, a canal was built to keep the branches of the Nile permanently open, enabling the water to fill Lake Quarren and keep the land fertile. The canal was so effective that it successfully functions even today. There is no record who built the canal, but for thousands of years, it has been known by one name. In Arabic, the name is Bahar Yosef, which translates the waterway of Joseph. I believe that Joseph is none other than the the, the Bible's account is a true account, an historical account of a man who lived, a man who was inspired by God's dreams, a man who literally saved multitudes in a famine. And so when the famine hit in, those seven years of famine came, Joseph's brothers who were in a distant land, they started to severely be suffering with that lack of food. And in their needs, they came to Egypt. And there they were ushered into the presence of this Egyptian official. They didn't recognize him, but it was their brother. They didn't recognize him. He was in, it was years later. They hadn't seen him for years. They thought he was probably dead. They would not have thought it was their brother. But then eventually Joseph reveals to them his identity. And they realize we're the one we sold, who sold you as a slave. This is what Joseph said, and I love this. Genesis 45, verse 5. It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Genesis 50. He said to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do you know that the things you go through in life, in life, you face things. In life, you are crippled by experiences. Some of you have gone through the worst of times. Some of you have gone through bereavement. Some of you have gone through situations at work. Some of you have gone through personal things, challenges that maybe no one else knows of that have totally devastated you and crippled you. For me, this has been the hardest year of my life. A year ago as a church, we had buildings, two buildings, which many of you contributed generously, selflessly to purchase. We had money in the bank. And here we are a year later, all taken away from us. My name slandered, the hardest year of my life. And yet the truth is, my conviction is in a God's, whether you've gone through what I've gone through, whether you've gone through what you've gone through, my conviction is, I believe in a God who can turn all things for the good. Who it says, absolutely. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I actually wouldn't swap places. I love where I am. I believe that God's caused everything. He has and he will cause it to turn together for the goods in your life, in my life, no matter what you're going through. We're so quick to meditate and focus on the evil that was intended. But instead, meditate and focus on the good that God's going to bring. Don't meditate like Joseph. He could have meditated on, you sold me. But he didn't. Instead, he meditated on, God sent me. And as a result, God turned it for the goods, and he'll do it for you too. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Why did Jacob call his son Joseph? Because he was thinking about Joseph from ancient times. And he had a faith that this son of mine, who's going to become a carpenter, somehow is going to bless the world. Little did he know 
So now let me tell you about Joseph's son, Jesus. Matthew 1.20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. We read this earlier. In a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Notice an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. That's strange. Because elsewhere in the, New, in the Old Testament, when angels appeared to people, typically they appeared in person. But isn't it interesting with Joseph, he appeared to him in a dream, linking him again to that historical figure of Joseph who had dreams. And he reminds Joseph of, you have a royal lineage, son of David, he calls him. David was that ancient, famous king. And here Joseph was being reminded, yeah, you're a carpenter. Yeah, you kind of work in a back of beyond place called Nazareth. You may seem like insignificant to the world, but God sees you're born in a royal lineage and God's going to use you to bring the greatest king into the world. And again, for those Josephs out there who feel like you're pretty insignificant, you don't feel your life's amounting to much. The great news is this. God has a purpose for you. He delights in bringing significance from the insignificant. So no matter who we are, God wants to do great things in and through our lives. He has a purpose. And so then the angel goes on and says in verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Why are you giving the name Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. Just as Joseph prophetically named his son Joseph, remembering the Joseph of the old times who saved multitudes from a famine, now Joseph called his son Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save multitudes from their sins. And I'm one of them. The most famous person ever born, the most famous name, Jesus. The first one to utter the name Jesus, the first human to name that child Jesus, was Joseph. What a privilege. The Time magazine every year, at the beginning of the year, names a man or woman of the year. At the beginning of each century, they name the man or woman of the century. But when the new millennium dawns in the year 2000s, they named Jesus the man of the millennium. And this is what they said about him. The most single, most powerful figure, not merely in these two millenniums, but in all human history has been Jesus of Nazareth. A serious argument can be made that no one else's life has proved remotely as powerful and enduring as that of Jesus. And they went on to write, born in an obscure village, he was a child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter shop and, until he was 30 years old. And then for three years, he traveled around the country, stopping long enough to talk to people who would listen and help where he could. He never wrote a book. He never had a hit record. He never went to college, never ran for public office, never had a family, never owned a house. He never did any of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. But when he was only 33 years old, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends rejected him. When he was arrested, very few wanted anything to do with him. After the trial, he was executed by the state along with admitted thieves. Only because a generous friend offered him his cemetery pot did he have a place to bury him. All this happened 19 centuries ago and the ultimate example of love. Now, it is no exaggeration to say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever set sail, all the rulers that have ever ruled, all the kings that have ever reigned on earth, all put together have not affected the life of man on earth like this one solitary life. Jesus. What a name. Why Jesus? Well, the angel said, the, the name literally means God, our Savior. 
You'll call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, Joseph and Jesus, it's like a parallel in history. Both Joseph and Jesus were loved by their father. Both Joseph and Jesus were shepherds over their father's flock. Both Joseph and Jesus were sent by their father to their brothers. Both Joseph and Jesus were hated by their brothers who sought to kill them. Both Joseph and Jesus were sold for pieces of silver. Both Joseph and Jesus were falsely accused. Both Joseph and Jesus were placed between criminals. One saved, the other lost. Both Joseph and Jesus were exalted by God after a season of suffering. Both Joseph and Jesus started their ministry age 30. And both Joseph and Jesus suffered to save multitudes. Jesus' name is Jesus because it means God, our Savior. Say that with me. God, our Savior. Since uh, 1939, Stan Lee has created some of the most popular superhero characters we all know, including Black Panther, Spider-Man, the X-Men, Thor, Iron Man, Fantastic Floor, The Incredible Hulk, Daredevil, and Ant-Man, and many others. Lee was also well known for his cameo appearances in many of those movies. I don't know if you know it, but since X-Men in the year 2000s, ever since then, every single movie, Stan Lee features in the movie. He casts himself into his own story. Isn't that cool? But he's not the first person to do this. God's the author of the salvation story didn't save us at a distance. He entered into his own story. God is our Savior. When you saw Jesus, you saw God. God had entered into human history. How did he save us? Well, he suffered. Joseph suffered, not willingly, it was imposed upon him. But God willingly chose to suffer for us. I had the, the best Costa coffee I've ever had in my life yesterday. And I did. It was from the Wester Hills. You know, in the Calder Road, there's a petrol station in Wester Hills. And uh, there's a Costa coffee machine there. Honestly, it was the best Costa coffee I've ever had. And you're all going to flood there after. I know you are. But here's what's happened, right? I'd, I'd filled up my car with petrol. I'd gone into the petrol station to pay for my petrol. And the guy at the, the till said, uh, num number three. I said, yeah, number three. He said, okay, that'll be 13 pounds. So I got my phone out and bing. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I'm number four. <laughs> and I paid for the other guy's fuel. <laughs> so I said, sorry, I'm number four. And the guy said, 70 pounds. <laughs> okay, that's probably more like it. Okay, bing, 70 pounds. Anyway, Guy number three walks in, and I said, mate, happy Christmas. I've just paid for your fuel for you. And I said, that's the reason for the season. So, something cheesy like that. It re oh, he was so affected. He, he became a Christian right there and then. But the, so anyway, he was so, he was like, well, thank you so much. I said, yeah, that's the reason for the season. And, 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 and then we all, but then the guy at the till said, hey, have a Costa coffee on us. Just because that was such a So. It tasted so good because I thought, I just blessed the guy, all right? So um, it, won't, it won't taste as good for you if you go to Wester Hills unless you buy someone their petrol. But, you know, I accidentally paid for someone's fuel. You know, I, I paid for them to go from where they are to where they need to be, right? I paid for them, but it was an accident. But God, it was no accident. He deliberately paid the price. He intentionally planned to pay the price for you. Some people say, and, and they're absolutely right, that Jesus is the reason for the season. But you know, the ultimate thing, if you were to ask God for the reason for the season, he wouldn't say Jesus. He would say, no, you're the reason for the season. The whole reason Jesus came was you. He came to pay the price for you. He came to pay the price to save you from your own sins, to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Do you know, 
It took famine before Joseph's brothers eventually came to Egypt. They wouldn't have come had it not been for the famine. They had to get to the place where they were desperate. Then they went. And then they bowed the knee to Joseph. Jesus has come to save you from your sins. But some of you aren't desperate enough. The idea that you're a sinner, you don't realize how serious that is. For for some of you, it's like, well, maybe. No, I, I have to say, I have to lovingly say, you're in the worst predicament ever as human being. You're a sinner, and therefore you need a savior. And not, not having a savior leaves you spiritually, eternally vulnerable in an incredibly precarious place. Your need is greater than you could imagine. You might be very comfortable in life, but if you don't have Jesus, you're lost. And I appeal to you to turn to him. In closing, let me just make this point. Joseph had a dream that one day his brothers would bow before him. And I don't think his brothers believed him. But it was exactly as Joseph said, happens. Let me read to you, in closing, a scripture. A prophetic prediction about you. You're in this verse. Now you might hear this verse and say, I don't believe it. But I guarantee you, one day, This verse will become a reality. Philippians 2, 9. God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, every knee and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. I predict, the Bible predicts, that one day there will be an ultimate acknowledgement of every existing person that Jesus is indeed Lord. Even rebels will have to acknowledge Jesus is Lord and King. But you know what will save your soul? Is if today you would acknowledge him, trust in him, declare him to be your Lord. This Jesus who died for you on the cross rose again. He's alive now. He is on the throne. Submit to him. Submit your entire life to him. This child born at Bethlehem is none other than Lord of all. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the incredible story of your coming. Thank you, you came. You came and you personally paid the price for the sins of the world. You did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And just like Joseph saved multitudes from a famine, Jesus, you saved multitudes from sins. And I can testify you've done it for me. And my prayer is you do it for everyone in this room and everyone joining us online. Thank you so much, you're the Savior. Thank you, you're on the throne. And we gladly and willingly bow our knee to you today. Just while we're all praying, I want each one of you, to take a moment and talk to him. And this is the amazing thing. This Jesus who walked on earth 2,000 years ago, he's Lord, and today you can talk to him. So just while everyone's eyes are closed, take a moment, talk to him. Why not be courageous and declare him to be Lord of your life? Even if you've done it before, just say, Jesus, I will gladly submit to you as King and Lord. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus to be your savior. Why not in this moment make the greatest decision of your life and submit to him as Lord and savior. Ask him to save you from your sins and he will. Trust in him. Allow him to change your life and become a follower of his. So Lord, every person who's making that decision just now, I pray you would bless them, change them, Transform them like you've done for me. We trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the really short notice but thank you for participating with us guess what we're gonna need your help again okay are you ready to go for this one and join us
we're going to sing this song, I want you to look to your neighbor and sing it with us. Have a wonderful break. Wow, worship team. Thank you so much. That yeah, was amazing. It really was. And Pastor Pete, thank you for your message as well. We really hope that all of you were touched by it in one way or another. Um, before we uh, <laughs> say bye, um, we have some exciting announcements. We won't be having um, any services on Boxing Day, mm -hmm. um, but we will be having um, our church online service. Oh, wow. And also, one more thing, uh, children, um, this afternoon at 2 p.m., we'll be having our cool Carol's Nativity service. Love that. And one. there's going to be the youth band, and you can also wear your um, nativity costumes as well, kids. Adults, you can do that too if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I think that's, that's all for, yeah. for today. Yeah. Thank you so much no for worries. sharing that in exciting times indeed. So now all that's left for me to do is to pray for you. Yeah. So as you go into this new week, I just want to pray that the love of Jesus will fill your heart and your mind mm. and that you will have peace all around yes. you um, yeah. so go into this week after such a beautiful service yeah. go into this week filled with joy with peace and with hope god bless you, bless and you. see you merry christmas, merry christmas. <laughs> bye, bye. Uh, my name is Eloho and that's Maria. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we have to do it again. I lost my I'm so tip. sorry. That's I'm why so... oh my that's God. why I went there. I forgot what I was supposed to say. It's alright. I'm so sorry. Um, you don't want to miss. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm so... <laughs>
I just forgot there was like 